Hi everybody, this is Dr. A. We've got your lesson on proteins, chapter 15 of Larson's Clinical Chemistry. Okay, so let's first talk with start with the physical and chemical composition of proteins. This is just a review from biology or anatomy. So um, proteins are made of amino acids, so amino acids are the building block of proteins. Uh, an amino acid contains a carboxyl group right here, an amino group right here, and then a carbon that is linked to an R group. And the R group is unique to each amino acid. And that's what differentiates one amino acid for, uh, from another. And they are linked by peptide bonds that are made between the carboxyl group of one amino acid with the amino group of another amino acid. So think of the amino and carboxyl groups as like plugs that can fit into each other and create a bond. So the way a peptide bond is made is the... OH um, group here from the um, carboxyl group is going to combine with one of the hydrogen atoms of the amino group and make H2O, water, and the bond is going to be formed here between the nitrogen and the carbon, uh, so the nitrogen of the amino group and the carbon of the carboxyl group, and then you have a dipeptide bond. Uh, meaning you have two peptides in this bond. Okay, so this is just an illustration of what the R groups can look like. You don't have to memorize any of this, but uh, these are all the amino acids, uh, polar and, I'm oh, sorry, nonpolar and polar, and the ones that have a positive charge and negative charge. You can see there are groups here vary, um, and some of them have ring structures, some of them have chains, uh, but that's what makes one amino acid different from another. And then, um, again, as a review, so proteins um, are made of amino acids. So the recipe for proteins is found in your DNA. And as your um, DNA code is read one code on at a time, each amino acid that matches that code on is added to the growing peptide chain, like, you know, pearls on the string here, if you will. And um, as they are added, those R groups start interacting with each other and they start start folding in uh, their secondary structure, which are gonna be um, like alpha helixes, beta pleated sheets, or even random coils. And then as those happen, then um, the protein takes on a tertiary or 3D structure. And um, then that uh, 3D structure gives it, um, but the, its shape give, is, um, gives it its function. So it needs to have the right 3D shape to have the right to have the function that it's meant to have. Now, uh, some proteins also have a quaternary structure. A quaternary structure is um, when you have to link up several proteins together to make um, a molecule. So a hemoglobin is an example of a protein that has a quaternary structure because it has um, two alpha globulins and uh, so globins, globins, two alpha globins and two beta globins uh, together. So there's four of them um, that have to come together to make the quaternary structure. Not all proteins have a quaternary structure, but they all have a primary, secondary, and tertiary structure. So um, simple proteins are uh, made of amino acids only. Um, the examples are your fibrous proteins, which are look like fibers, right? Collagen, elastin, and keratin. And some of them are globular, so they'll be more round, uh, such as albumin, globulin, and histones. Now, there you can also have conjugated proteins. And so conjugated protein is a protein, which is often, often referred to as the apoprotein. If you see this apo thing, um, it means it's, it's the protein portion of that molecule without its group plus a non-protein, which is a pr prosthetic group. The prosthetic group can be things like a, a metal ion, um, a carbohydrate, a lipid, um, something. So um, the, the protein, the apoprotein, plus its prosthetic groups, for example, you have your nuclear proteins, mucoproteins, glycoproteins, lipoproteins, metalloproteins, and phosphoproteins. Um, most plasma proteins are negatively charged at normal blood pH due to the fact that blood pH is greater than the net charge of the protein, so it's greater than its isoelectric point. So just always think of proteins in our body, proteins in our blood having a negative charge. 
So um, proteins can be differentiated based on their properties. Um, so if you differentiate them based on size, you know, smaller and uh, larger molecules and smaller molecules, you can use, for example, dialysis and ultrafiltration. Uh, those are two methods that can enable proteins to be separated from uh, smaller molecules based on their size. Proteins are, are generally larger molecules. Um, solubility, the solubility of a protein can be changed by changing um, the pH ionic strength or temperature of the solution that it's in uh, to make it more soluble or less soluble in uh, the medium. And um, electrical charge, so uh, electrical charges can alter the speed at which a protein migrates through a medium. That's, for example, uh, for electrophoresis, but it's also used in ion exchange chromatography. So uh, dealing, you know, dealing with the fact of uh, you know, positive or negative charge or how positive or negatively charged that protein is. Usually, again, somewhere in the realm of negative charge. What do proteins do in the body? Um, so they are transporters, so they move stuff around uh, in the blood. So albumin um, moves all kinds of stuff drugs, but also other molecules. Lipoproteins uh, transport our lipids. Transcordin uh, will transport cortisol. Thyroid binding globulin, also known as um, yeah, TBG, it can carry thyroxine, etc. They're way more than that. So some of them, their job is just to ferry stuff from point A to point B. Some of them function as receptors. Um, so they are found on the surface of cells and they transmit hormonal signals into the cells. So glycoproteins are um, such proteins. Your ABO proteins, for example, are uh, glycoproteins on your red cells. Um, they, some of them function as enzymes. So we've already done a chapter on enzymes. Uh, you glo they're especially your globulins and your metalloproteins. So they facilitate chemical reactions within the cells. And um, some of them are structural. Uh, so, um, structural body tissue, so collagen and keratin, uh, collagen making your skin strong, but also uh, with elastin making it elastic, keratin making your hair strong, nails strong, uh, so they're, they're structural. Um, they uh, can maintain the colloid osmotic pressure, so that's the role mainly of albumin, meaning it holds water um, in where it's located. So um, albumin is a predominant protein in plasma and one of its job is to hold water in plasma. Uh, we're going to go over that when we go over albumin specifically. Some of them are antibodies like your globulins and um, some of them are uh, the proteins to um, coagulation factors and they can do coagulation. So we have antibodies and coagulation we have structural proteins, we have that it maintains colloid osmotic pressure, there are enzymes, there are receptors, meaning they catch uh, hormonal signals, and there are transporters. Okay, so let's start with plasma proteins. So total protein is more than half albumin, and the rest are globulins. So globulins are round proteins. Uh, you get your proteins uh, from meats, um, eggs, dairy has some protein in it too, uh, fish, uh, and then plant sources such as beans and peas and lentils. The concentration of your plasma proteins is affected by your nutritional status, meaning um, if you're having uh, an adequate protein intake for what's going on in your body. Physiological changes, so like getting sick or growing, that's another physiological um, change. And uh, synthesis rates, so how well your body can make proteins. So the liver is going to be the main factory making the proteins. Um, and, uh, but it also well, it makes albumin in the coagulation factors and a bunch of the other proteins. Um, and uh, clearance rates, so uh, how they are turned over, but also if they are lost in urine. Um, that's only evident usually in um, disease states with um, renal impairment, um, renal damage. So albumin and prealbumin are used to assess nutritional status, and so we're going to go over that, um, because your total protein levels do tend to remain fairly constant. 
Um, inflammation will decrease some acute phase proteins, such as like CRP, but it will decrease others, such as albumin. Uh, and the ones that it um, increases, we always call those acute phase proteins. Um, protein clearance is um, part of, part of protein clearance is protein catabolism, which is normal. So, one of the things that um, is unique about protein is we really don't have a way to store it. Uh, we can store glucose as glycogen, and then if we have excess, uh, if we have enough glycogen stores. We can store, um, we can convert glucose to triglycerides and store it as lipids, um, triglycerides and new fats. So we can store fat, we can store glucose, but we cannot store protein. And so you're, you're needing an, you need an intake of protein because your body's constantly um, turning it over and, uh, you know, doing maintenance on your body. And so, yeah, there is a certain amount of protein catabolism that goes on daily. Uh, the half-life varies by protein, and the protease enzymes break them down into reusable amino acids and the non-protein nitrogenous compounds, which are waste, and um, they will, we'll have our own lesson on those, but those are things like uh, blood urea, nitrogen, creatinine, uric acid, um, so ammonia, those are all non-protein nitrogenous compounds. Uh, so it definitely tries to recycle and not waste. So if it can reuse the amino acid, it's going to reuse it. But anything that it cannot reuse, it's going to break it down and clear it uh, as a non-protein nitrogenous compound. Uh, protein losing states are going to be starvation, where you're not getting enough nutrients uh, or maybe not, e not getting enough protein in the diet. And then uh, nephrotic syndrome is a renal disease where there is a massive loss of uh, protein through the kidneys. But other disease states in the kidneys can cause loss of protein and then leaves the body through the urine and is not supposed to. All right, we're going to look at a case. So Bill is 65 year old. Uh, he suffers from fatigue and bone pain in his hips. His physician ordered lab tests and the results are their hemoglobin is low at 10.2, the creatinine is 0.9, which is normal, the albumin is 3.0, which is low, and the total protein is 9.5, which is normal. So then here's an example here where albumin can shift before total protein really does. So um, which of these are considered normal? Well, you can just see which ones are marked low. And then what do you think the diagnosis might be? So um, just thinking through that, he definitely doesn't have any renal issues like nephrotic syndrome is not causing him to lose proteins because his creatinine is normal. So we can rule out kidney issues. But something's going on with him with anemia and a low albumin with a normal, pretty decent level of protein. It's actually kind of on the high end of normal. And so um, we're going to talk about what he has in a little bit, but likely this is a case of a type of cancer called multiple myeloma. So that is this probable diagnosis. And so if you're in my Nearpod, those are the two questions that follow. What lab results are abnormal? And what do you think is wrong with them? Okay, so our first specific protein uh, is prealbumin. Um, it is also known as transthyretin, or abbreviated as TTR. So this is the same protein, it just has two names. And depending on which lab you're in, it'll, they'll call it one or the other. It is a transporter protein. It's found in serum and spinal fluid, and it carries the thyroid hormone thyroxine, and it carries retinol binding protein bound to retinol. Retinol is vitamin A, and so it's in the name. It transports thyroxine and retinol. So transthyretin, that's where you got the name from. Uh, it is synthesized in the liver and in the choroid plexus, which is what makes spinal fluid. Um, it is, yeah, so it, it is present in spinal fluid. And um, why we measure this is prealbumin is more sensitive to changes in protein energy status than albumin. So it's the best marker we have to check for starvation or, um, or simply just not eating enough. Um, its concentration closely reflects, reflects recent dietary intake. It is a negative acute phase reaction, meaning it goes down when you have inflammation and infections, and it is also decreased in liver disease because the capacity to produce those proteins during liver disease is going to be decreased. 
Um, it is measured using usually immunotribidometric assays or nephilometry. Okay, so a question to think about, I just want you to think about, so why would we test this? Who is at risk for protein, energy, malnutrition? Um, and so this is just going to depend on the area that you, that you live in, but there are areas in the United States where even children aren't getting enough to eat um, because they're not well cared for. The only time they get food is at school. So, you know, that's one way to check uh, to see if they're getting enough protein and energy, um, you know, good nutrition. And then the other big uh, population at risk for protein, energy, and malnutrition is going to be your elderly. And mostly because they, you know, kind of lose interest in eating or they're not cooking for themselves or they only eat one meal a day um, or they're not just not eating enough protein. Our next, and this is the most abundant protein, is albumin. So... It, albumin makes up the largest percentage of protein. More than half of the protein in your blood is albumin. Uh, you, find, you can find it in serum, spinal fluid, interstitial fluid, which is the fluid between your cells, urine to a certain degree. You don't have a lot of albumin in your urine, um, and amniotic fluid. So it is responsible for most of the colloid osmotic pressure of intravascular fluid, uh, and this maintains the appropriate fluid balance in tissue. So uh, the idea is the albumin, um, what it does is when water is pushed out into the capillary bed from the pressure of uh, the heart beating and pushing the blood through the capillary beds that's coming from the arterial end with high pressure, that water moves out of the capillary beds into the tissue, um, and that causes the protein concentration to become um, more elevated than at, on the venous end of your capillary, and then it pulls, because of that, it pulls, uh, it uses osmotic pressure to pull water back into itself, uh, and whatever doesn't return to it will go into the lymphatic system. And so uh, having enough albumin allows you to be able to pull that water back into the cardiovascular system. So intravascular fluid, uh, to have a, an appropriate amount of intravascular uh, fluid into your um, vascular system, so into your uh, veins and arteries, you have to have enough albumin. And then albumin, its second job is to transport stuff. So water balance and transport stuff. So it can transport thyroid hormones, other fat-soluble hormones, and conjugated bilirubin and fatty acids, and also other drugs um, Drugs that you, can you take. Uh, so why do we check albumin? Um, so um, increased levels are usually um, a sign of dehydration. So it's not that you're making too much. It's just that you've lost water, and, will, and so therefore it's like a false increase. It's, it's only increased because there's not enough water. Um, and decreased levels are more significant. So this is what we're looking for in albumin is, is there a decreased production by the liver or are you losing it in the kidneys? Um, or are you just not eating enough? So decreased levels can be due to malnutrition, malabsorption. So if you have, if a patient has GI issues, a, a Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, um, something that's messing with their gut, they, they won't absorb all their nutrients as well. And so they are at risk for um, low albumin, low protein, um, and malabsorption, because, due to malabsorption. Liver disease, because uh, the liver is what makes albumin. So if it is disease, they'll have a harder time producing it. Renal loss. So we're not usually losing albumin through the kidneys, but that can happen. And then hemodilution would be if... Um, you gave the patient too much fluid um, or a lot of fluid um, in a short amount of time through IV therapy. The lab procedures, it's usually a color reaction that uses either bromcrestle green or bromcrestle purple, and it's read with a spectral photometer on uh, most of your large analyzers. So a question to think about here is what symptoms would you expect from someone whose liver has failed and therefore he has that person has very low plasma albumin levels? So, okay, the liver is making the albumin. The liver is not producing enough albumin. Therefore, there's not enough albumin in the blood. If there's not enough albumin in your blood, it won't be able to hold the water into the blood and uh, in the plasma. And so the water will leave and will go into the tissues and it will stay there. So the two consequences of that are going to be that 
um, that patient will have a low blood pressure because it's just it's not holding the water in, in the veins and arteries, and they're going to have swelling, um, a typical swelling of liver failure called ascites, where um, that fluid that's supposed to be in a cardiovascular system is going to be around in the abdominal area, in the tissues, and they're going to be retaining fluid but have really low blood pressure. Next protein is alpha fetoprotein. So we're into the alpha globulins here. So we went, um, it, these are, these proteins, we're going to, um, over them in order of their pattern on a uh, serum protein electrophoresis. So it's pre-albumin because it peaks before albumin, then albumin, and then we're going to do the alpha globulins and then the beta globulins and then the gamma globulins. So alpha fetoprotein is alpha globulin. Um, it is predominantly found in a developing embryo in the fetus, and it has a job there to do. Uh, and then it can also be found in the parenchymal cells of the liver in adults. Um, it is used as a tumor marker in primary hepatoma, ovarian cancer, and testicular embryonal carcinoma, uh, because increased levels um, you know, could correlate with those. Um, it is used also in the assessment of neural tube def defects in pregnant women. So this is a one of the blood tests that they do early in the second trimester, um, where a high alpha fetoprotein uh, then indicates that there are some possible neural tube defects, such as spinal bifida, and that we need to do more testing or more imaging to see what's going on with the baby. And um, also in pregnant women, so when they draw it, if then if the levels are low, then it, they, the baby may sus be suspected of having Down syndrome, and then further testing would be uh, need to, to be done to confirm that. So the lab methods for this is going to be a chemiluminescence immunoassay. Um, it is the most the most common screening test today is the quad screen. This is a screening test for pregnant women where uh, they test alpha fetoprotein, HCG, estriol, and inhibin A as a panel to help see what's going on. It, are there possible neural tube defects? Does the baby have Down syndrome? Uh, so this is a uh, prenatal screening test. And it's a tumor marker. Okay, alpha-2 microglobulin, another alpha globulin. Uh, it is a large tetramer that's synthesized by the liver. Uh, its job is to transport hormones and enzymes. Um, it has both effector and inhibitor functions in the development of the lymphatic system, meaning effector as in it facilitates the development and inhibitor as in it stops or, or stops certain processes. Um, it can inhibit components of the complement system and hemostatic system. Um, so complement system is activated when you're fighting off infections and hemostatic is coagulation. Your, the clinical correlation, why would we want to check alpha-2 microglobulin? So increased levels are found in nephrotic syndrome. And why would that be? Because we just said earlier nephrotic syndrome is a, a renal disease where you're losing a lot of protein. And the thing is, this guy is so big that even with the damaged kidney, it won't, it can't cross over from the blood into the urine. So um, the other lower molecular weight proteins are lost, but this one stays behind, and therefore it'll be, uh, it's more like a relative increase. Um, patients that have acute pancreatitis will exhibit low serum concentration of alpha-2 microglobulin, and that can correlate with the severity of this disease. So if a physician needs to assess prognosis or whether you know, the patient needs intensive care or something, uh, they could do an alpha-2 microglobulin. Um, so it is usually estimated using um, serum protein electrophoresis. Uh, if you need definitive quantitation, you would have to do an ELISA, so that's the type of immunoassay. The next one is um, ceruloplasmin. It's a, still another alpha globulin. Uh, so it's a copper-containing alpha-2 glycoprotein enzyme uh, that is synthesized in the liver, made in the liver. It's, uh, you'll see most of these proteins are made in the liver. Um, and incorporation of the copper into that structure happens during the synthesis of ceruloplasmin in the hepatocytes. And obviously its job is to transport copper. 
and uh, the peroxidase enzyme aids in the conversion of ferrous to ferric irons, which then enables iron to be transported from the liver, and it needs uh, this uh, enzyme. Uh, this enzyme needs cerebelloplasma to do that. All right, um, so it is an acute phase reactant, meaning it goes up during inflammation, uh, and so you'll see elevated levels in inflammation, severe infections, and tissue damage. Uh, and decreased levels can be genetic in Wilson's disease with uh, a low serum levels of ceruloplasmin and in Menke's disease, uh, or they can be acquired because of malnutritional malabsorption. Uh, it is assessed uh, in the lab uh, using immunoassays or uh, nephilometry. Haptoglobulin, uh, sorry, haptoglobin, not globulin, haptoglobin is another alpha 2 glycoprotein made in the liver by hepatocytes. Um, and its target is hemoglobin. So it's an immunoglobulin like plasma protein. It's not an immunoglobulin, it just kind of resembles it a little bit. And it picks up hemoglobin. It doesn't pick up bacteria, it picks up hemoglobin. Uh, so hemoglobin that's been freed by a red cell that's been lysed um, or destroyed. And so uh, it's, it's basically a hemoglobin scavenger. If the hemoglobin binding capacity of haptoglobin is exceeded, then hemoglobin will pass through the renal glomeruli and you'll get hemoglobinuria or you'll be able to detect hemoglobin in the urine, which could be a sign of then massive intravascular hemolysis going on. Uh, so we see elevated levels in many inflammatory diseases and burns, so because it is an acute phase protein, meaning it goes up when you have inflammation, uh, but decreased levels is um, what we'd really be concerned with because that would be an indication of a hemolytic anemia uh, or possible, you know, a transfusion reaction. So because uh, the cells are being lysed and therefore all the uh, hemoglobin is being freed and the haptoglobin is being bind up, um, by the hemoglobin trying to scavenge it. We uh, tested by tuberometric and nephilometric immunoassays. So then a little question here, if your patient had a hemolytic transfusion reaction, what would you uh, expect his haptoglobin to be? Would it be high or low? And so since we said it would be bound up in um, by hemoglobin, then those levels will be low. Next one is transferrin. It's another glycoprotein synthesized by the liver. It is a negative acute phase protein, meaning it goes down when inflammation is happening. It's an iron transporter, um, and its job is to prevent the loss of iron through the kidneys. So it picks up any kind of iron that it finds, and it transports it back and forth to storage uh, if we're using the bone marrow. And um, so, um, if it if it's stored if it's transporting iron to be stored iron will be stored as ferritin transferrin can also carry iron to the cells that synthesize hemoglobin and other iron containing compounds remember iron is used also in the mitochondria so you know a lot of the cells may need iron so uh, iron deficiency anemia would lead to high transferrin levels because that transferrin is going to be looking going around looking for some iron to scavenge and to bring it in uh, because we need it. Uh, decreased production of transferrin is going to be seen in liver disease, obviously. Malnutrition, because you're not going to get enough protein. And excessive loss uh, via the kidneys and your protein losing disorders, just as your nephrotic syndromes. Low transferrin levels can um, lead to decreased hemoglobin production and thus anemia because it's not able to, um, the iron can't be delivered. So if you don't have enough transferrin, so you could basically, what it's saying is you could have a liver disease or a kidney disease, and because of that, you don't have enough transferrin to ferry the iron around, and so you're not producing enough hemoglobin, therefore enough red cells, and you have, and then, so that's one of the ways you get anemia, chronic disease. Um, a transfer anemia, meaning need a total absence of transfer in the blood, leads to an anemia uh, that's, you know, pretty you know, steady and also hemosiderosis of the heart and liver uh, because the iron that is absorbed or that, that is, it's stuck there. Um, and so that's not good because 
uh, that can cause damage to the heart and the liver. And it's assayed in the lab using turbidimetric and nephilometric immunoassay methods. So this is a little memory check. Do you remember if your patient has iron deficiency anemia with a low ferritin, what would its transferrin be? And so the answer was there earlier. Uh, it would be that um, you would expect it to be high. Uh, your immunoglobulins. So we've moved into the gamma globulins. Um, and uh, those immunoglobulins are gamma globulins, um, and they're, they're also known as antibodies. So gamma globulins, immunoglobulins, antibody, three different words for the same thing. They are produced by B lymphocytes, um, and they are made of uh, heavy chains and light chains. So there's two heavy chains and two light chains, and they're differentiated based on their heavy chains which the heavy chains are gamma, mu, alpha, delta, or epsilon, meaning IgG, IgM, IgA, IgD, and IgE. And then the light chains are kappa and lambda chains. Uh, so IgG is a monomer, meaning a single Y, with uh, your two heavy chains and two light chains. Um, it's a secondary immune system response, uh, and it's used in the defense against infection, especially bacterial infection. Uh, and it's also uh, the antibody that's produced uh, as a result of vaccination. IgM is a pentamer, so it's five of these Ys put together tail end, uh, and it's the primary immune system response. So it's also part of, uh, of your innate immune response. It is a complement activator. IgM is also your ABO antibodies. IgA is a dimer, so it's two of these tail to tail. Uh, and it's found in secretions such as anywhere there's mucus, so GI secretions, um, respiratory secretions, and they're protective. Uh, they're part of your immune um, system's protection uh, against infections. IgE is a monomer, so again, a, a single Y, um, and it's involved in allergic reaction. Its tail here is a little bit longer than that of IgG, and IgD is a monomer also, but it's... Uh, tail end is buried on into the membrane of a lymphocyte and it acts as a receptor on lymphocytes. So let's talk about immunoglobulin deficiency. So signs and symptoms of an immunoglobulin deficiency are going to be recurrent bacterial infections that begin at an early age. Um, this can be treated with injections of immunoglobulin along with antibiotics to treat the infection on a regular basis. Um, selective deficiency, so you could uh, m you could be missing a lot of them or just one class. Um, so, for example, selective IgA deficiency, you will see recurrent infections in the ear, sinuses, bronchitis, and GI tract infections. Everywhere there's mucus, uh, and everywhere you would have IgA. A gamma globulinemia uh, means you are not producing antibodies at all. None of them. No gamma globulins. Uh, so you have no functional humoral immunity, uh, and you will, the patient will have upper and lower respiratory tract infections and chronic diarrhea. Um, and acquired deficiencies can be the result of treatment with immunosuppressive drugs, such as seen in um, transplant patients. So if you have increased levels of immunoglobulins in the blood, it would be called immunoglobulinemia, uh, and it can be polyclonal or monoclonal. When um, the immunoglobulin levels rise together, so all, all of them, so IgG, IgM, like they all go up, right? It's a signal that the body is usually responding to an infection. Uh, and the, le the levels may rise relative to each other. So, for example, IgG can may rise proportionally more than the others. Uh, but this is a normal response. So on a serum protein electrophoresis plate, there's usually a diffuse band in the gamma region. So here's a protein electrophoresis pattern where you have your albumin, your alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2, and then gamma. This is normal. Uh, with a polyclonal gammopathy here, you, you have your pattern here with albumin, alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2, and then you have this big bump, kind of a, looks like a heel here in your gamma region. Uh, if it's a monoclonal um, immunoglobulinemia, then uh, <clears throat> it's usually a sign of disease. So on a serum electrophoresis plate, there will be a sharp, distinct peak. So you can see here, 
uh, one, you have less albumin and you have alpha one, alpha two, there are kind of decreased and beta one, beta two are decreased. And then the other gammas are kind of decreased, but then you have this one sharp peak here of the one category of immunoglobulins that's increased. Um, and so an immunoelectrophoresis uh, test is what uh, can help differentiate what is going on here with these peaks and these uh, gamma globulins. In uh, multiple myeloma is such a disease where you would have this monoclonal gammopathy. Uh, it is a plasma cell cancer. Plasma cells, as you remember, are B cells that have been synthesized to make antibodies. Uh, and there's, so it's a single clone of cells that produces increased amount of immunoglobulins, most likely it's going to be IgG. And um, as these cells clone and proliferate, uh, your normal plasma cells are then unable to form. So uh, these immunoglobulins are seen on a sim serum electrophoresis plate, and they're called M proteins. So again, normal patterns in blue, multiple myeloma one, you can see that peak here in green. So um, this is seen in people older than 40, with the highest incidence seen in those older than 70. The signs and symptoms of multiple myeloma are anemia, a recent history of bacterial infections, and often a broken hip or bone pain. So this is what was going on with our patient, our bill, our case at the beginning. And in your lab results, you will see high levels of calcium and high levels of total protein. So his total protein, even though it was still normal, was, it was actually really on the high end of normal. And an elevated serum viscosity, so you'll see RULO, um, which is when the red cells look like they uh, were stacked like coins and knocked over. Uh, and this is because they're sticking together because of that high serum viscosity because of the high levels of protein, total protein. And so IgG is the most common heavy chain associated with multiple myeloma, representing this peak right here. Next, you've got Waldenstrom microglobulinemia. Uh, it's a lymphoproliferative disease where you see high levels of IgM uh, is produced. The signs and symptoms are also hyperviscosity of the blood, um, which causes complications such as weakness, peripheral neuropathy, and Raynaud's phenomenon. This is Raynaud's phenomenon. So like the, the circulation in their tips, is, um, fingertips here is completely blocked. There's no blood here uh, being able to access the fingers. Um, malignant plasma cells can infiltrate not only the bone marrow, but also other organs, such as the spleen and the lymph nodes, um, uh, whereas multiple myeloma is confined only to the bone marrow. Uh, don't, lab results don't help the diagnosis, but they can rule out things. Um, and obviously cryoglobulinemia is also found in this disease, uh, and that occurs when the immunoglobulins produced are, will precipitate at low temperatures. Next is myoglobin. So um, myoglobin is essentially a single chain of hemoglobin, and uh, it's just instead of the four, it's just one of the globins with a heme group. It is similar to hemoglobin. It has a heme group and it can bind oxygen and it is located in your muscles. This is why it's called myoglobin. It is in your muscles. Um, myoglobin uh, is found in muscles. It's, relate, it's released in the blood after muscle tissue is damaged. So it's a sign of muscle injury. And large amounts are released after crushing injuries. So trauma, falling, having something fall on you, four wheeler, wreck, uh, car wreck, um, and also in a skeletal muscle disease it's called rhabdomyolysis where there is a lysing or a splitting up, um, breaking down of the muscles and all the muscle components are released in the blood. Unfortunately, myoglobin is really toxic to the kidneys and it can lead to acute renal failure. Um, so this is uh, something that you really don't want to see high levels of in the blood. Um, it is non-specific to, and it won't tell you what muscle. Uh, it can be elevated in a heart attack because a, the heart is a muscle, but uh, anything that would damage muscle will elevate myoglobin. Um, classic uh, lab methods are gonna be uh, nephilometry, turbidimetry, and immunofluorescence. So uh, a little bit on urine protein. So um, the time horseful protein is a protein that makes up the cast matrix that can be seen, the cast can be seen in urine. Um, 
Di a little bit on diabetes and albumin. So one of the many consequences of diabetes is going to be kidney disease. So uh, the, the high glucose insulin mix uh, definitely uh, affects the kidneys and starts causing sl slow destruction of the glomeruli. And um, the, the, the basement membrane in the glomerular lies basically was being damaged by the high levels of glucose. And what happens is, is that is being damaged then albumin, which is normally repelled by the basement membrane and not allowed to enter into the urine, now can start seeping into the urine a little at a time. Um, and so uh, a lot of times, we, you know, that screening for albumin in the urine uh, is a must for diabetic patients, and they even have a test called microalbumin that looks for trace amounts of albumin in the urine of diabetic patients. And this is so that uh, if you start seeing that, you can get on them and catch them uh, before the kidney damage is extensive. Uh, qualitative assays to assay urine protein are you just your urine that sticks part of your urine analysis and your quantitative assays are going to be your microalbumin and your colorimetric methods that can be done on the big analyzers same way as uh, albumin and total protein can be done. Um, the limitation is urine protein assays can be affected by abnormally colored urines and drugs and a highly alkalinized urine can also lead to a false positive result on your urine uh, protein, urine dipstick. Uh, cerebral spinal fluid protein. So um, spinal fluid provides a physiological system to supply nutrients to the nervous tissue. It removes metabolic waste and it produces also a mechanical barrier to cushion the brain and the spinal cord against trauma. Uh, albumin is not synthesized in the CNS, but it you know, can make it in there. Uh, so uh, if any albumin is present in the spinal fluid, then it means it has crossed a blood-brain barrier, which means the blood-brain barrier has been damaged. So um, in the lab methods, we can do CSF albumin to a serum albumin ratio. And this can help assess the amount of damage to the blood-brain barrier. And a total CSF protein is also performed using the same reagent as for urine protein. Um, you can also do IgG levels uh, in spinal fluid, um, and that's performed by nephilometry to check for infections uh, also. So a, you know, a, um, when the spinal tap is done, a spinal fluid is done, then it is not unusual to do a spinal fluid protein and also a spinal fluid glucose. There'll be more on that on the end of neuro chapter, um, neuro lesson that's going to be coming up later. Uh, and so, yeah, your last question, tell me if you have any questions. If you're on YouTube, you can drop it in the comments. And I thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>